all for coming to our final uh, seminar in our evening series here. Um, tonight, I'm really excited. We have Todd Van Loo, uh, who, as you probably have gathered, is an airport firefighter over at BWI. He's going to be talking about airport firefighting uh, tactics and strategies this evening. So thank you for coming out tonight, Todd. No problem. Really thank you, Helen. really glad to have you. Thank you all for coming to our program this evening. Hello. Uh, my name is... Uh, Driver operator Todd Van Loo, um, up at BWI Airport, as you can tell. Uh, I've been there for 10 years. It'll be well, 10 years in April. But um, so what I'm just going to talk a little bit about is uh, basically how, how you go about becoming one, some of the equipment and tools we use at the airport, um, and, uh, and answer any questions you, you all might have. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick poll. Mostly pilots tonight. Pilot, not yet. But on, on the other side of the windscreen, hopefully we'll never meet. <laughs> um, well, I'll start off with, and, and a lot of the people ask, you know, how come, you know, and, and you guys have a lot more knowledge, but the reason that some airports do have a, a, a professional fire department on scene or on site is um, the airports that comply with the title, the, the federal title 49 CFR are required to have emergency response equipment and personnel to accommodate the longest air carrier aircraft that has five scheduled departures and arrivals daily. So that's the key is the five scheduled arrivals and departures. BWI, I'm sure you've seen the World Airlines, they have 747s there. Uh, British Air has a seven, new one of the new 787s that comes in, but it's only one per day. The World Airlines are not a daily, regularly scheduled arrivals and departures. So at BWI, we're a, a high class B, and I'll go into this, or a low C airport. So what FAA divides it into different indexes of airports. A class A airport is any, the planes are less than 90 feet, which would be similar to like a CRJ, a regional jet. A class B, 90 to 126 foot in length, which is a 737 or a DC-9. Uh, a C is 129 to 150. 126 to 159, which is roughly about a 757. So that's what BWI, if we have a lot, like if Delta or them start picking up their 757s, we go back, we bump up into a C. If they're not flying, we're back into a B. So we, we bounce upon there. We keep the, the fire department equipment there for a class C at any one time. Um, and then as you get larger, a class D airport goes up to 200 foot in length. That's like a DC-10 or 767. And lastly, you've got a Class E, which is anything over 200, which was 747, the new A380s, the, the, the bigger planes. Um, with that, there's three groups of people that are involved in any kind of airplane that the FAA is, is considered part of the uh, airplane emergency. First is the flight deck crew, second are the flight attendants, and third is the ARF personnel. So. The first two are the most important, and, and I'll go into the, a little bit why, but the flight deck crew is responsible for, A, getting her on the ground and on her wheels. The flight attendants are the ones that have to evacuate the aircraft. Most aircraft are, are, ha, can be evacuated with a full load in under 90 seconds. They, they test them on new air, airplanes, and if you want, you can go to YouTube and you can actually watch the test where they take people and they put them in the airplane and they sit there and watch them come out all the slides. Um, and then finally is the ARF personnel. But if there is any kind of emergency, the final call as to evacuate that aircraft comes from the flight deck personnel. We could recommend it, but if the flight deck crew does not want to evacuate the aircraft, it has, it's, it's, it's the pilot's airplane and he has the final say. Um, our job as ARF is to create conditions that allow survival to be possible and evacuation and rescue can occur. So for example, if you have an exterior fire, like some of the videos you've seen, um, Las Vegas recently and things like that, our job is we call it, we, we come in and we cut what's called a fire lane, where we come in and just, well, I don't want to say we're not worried about the aircraft, we're worried about making sure the escape paths from the aircraft are clear of fire. So if you look at some of those videos, and I, we could sit here for hours and, and go on, but like the Las Vegas one was a perfect example. The first crash truck there got himself between the fire and the people leaving the airplane. So he held that fire back to make sure the people coming out of the tail of the aircraft had a clear, had a clear path. Um, 
And it, if, of course, the flight crews and the interior cabin crew is disabled, we can start evacuation procedures from the outside. Towards the end, I have a little video showing you how we're, we pop doors from the outside. Um, it's a little more complicated on those, on those bigger airplanes, but we do, we do train on that. So our, we said we cut the fire lanes and make sure everybody, our primary is, like I said, to create a path for evacuation and rescues of crew and passengers. Second priority is to neutralize, uh, neutralize the fire or explosion danger. So our first priority, and some people have said, you know, oh, well, they let the, the, the other part of the plane was burning. Our first priority is to make sure every, everybody's out of the airplane that's going to be able to get out of the airplane. Then we work on extinguishing the fire, the fuel spill fire, the under, under plane fires and things like that. Um, and then after that, we assist the, the, the passengers with any kind of medical issues or, or, or um, further evacuations that they might have. Now at BWI, to accomplish that, we have four of these crash trucks. These are our airport crash trucks. We have two of this style, and I'll show you there's two of a different style, a newer style. Um, at any one time, we have to have three of them in operation. So like tonight, I would have loved to have brought one, but one of our trucks is down for maintenance. So I can't take one of the other ones from the airport. But if anybody wants, I know it's a long drive, but I know where there's always guys 24-7, 365 days a year, and we don't get many visitors. We really like to have visitors. So, um, but we have four of those units. We also have one uh, fire engine, which is similar like you see on Kent Island or in Easton, um, carries the hose in the water. That is staffed with four people. The crash trucks are only staffed with a driver. So that's what's a little different. If any of you have any military experience, military crash crews have three, a driver, a crew chief, and a firefighter. At most, I don't want to say most, at a lot of um, commercial airline, airports, there's usually only driver only. Um, and everything can be done uh, with just a driver from the cab. I don't have to get out of the cab. Um, everything, it's a matter of hitting the right buttons in the right sequence and uh, you can flow foam or water. We have the engine that has four people on it, four firefighters. Their job is to assist with the cutting of the fire lanes. So they would pull a hand line, help with the chutes, help passengers off the chutes. Their job is pretty much exterior of the aircraft. The next is our tower crew, which is a ladder tower. I'm sure you've seen them. Big, big fire truck, ladder on top, goes up and down. That's our tower crew. Their primary responsibility is to ladder the aircraft and get inside the aircraft, if possible, and assist with evacuating anybody that's injured or incapacitated. So you've got the engine crew stays outside, the ladder crew goes inside for rescue. And last, we have uh, two ambulances staffed by paramedics. Their job is to set up for the, uh, any casualties they might have um, from the aircraft evacuation. Total minimum staff at BWI to cover all of BWI airport is 16 people. So that's, that's what we have on shift at any one time. Now we also run mutual aid to Anne Arundel County, Baltimore City, Baltimore County. So at times like an ambulance might be over in, the, in there or at times our fire trucks or fire engines. There have been times where they've called special calls for these units. Um, as, a, as a chief once told me, they said uh, you're not going to fight a lot of house fires, things like that. But when you get the call to go to a fire, it's going to be something that no one knows how to put out. And I've had a couple of them, and it's been quite the experience that uh, pretty much they realize when they, they've exhausted their possible possibilities, they call the airport and we come in with our foam trucks and we, we do our special little dances with them. Um, so any, any questions about so far what we have at BWI? I'll show you some of the pictures of some of the units and things like that. So. You said 16 people. Is that... Is that per shift? Yes, per shift. When we work, we work a, a, a 24, 72 shift. So I work one day on, and there's three days off. So there's a total of four shifts. So at any one time, that depending on like today, C shift is working. I work tomorrow. I'm on D shift. Is that 24 hours? Yep, 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. So we work 24 hours. Um, some days, it's a long 24 hours, um, but. Oh, that they don't they don't happen and that's a really good thing. Yes, sir. You want mutual aid to like a gas truck? Yes. Yes. Like you still the, do that single single uh, operator or a lot of times depending on depending on the call, 
it might we might send like if they call for a crash truck a lot of times we'll try to send our engine our fire engine with it just so he's got more people that know how to work with the truck and, and there's more personnel sometimes if we can't send the engine we might put an extra firefighter on the truck just to help the driver out um, I went to one Brandon Shores where they didn't have a chance to send the engine so they just took an extra firefighter put him with me and said you two go and take care of this um, like the, the, the gas truck fire on, four, on uh, 895 there's a picture of that I have it in uh, towards the tail end of the, the um, um, lecture it shows the, just the picture of that truck and that, that actually went with the uh, tower and, la and uh, engine with, to that one to help with the, with the truck that kind of call out for the system what impact does that have on the, on on the airport the assets at the airport yeah. well if let's say like tonight we had a call out like that there's and, and don't quote me there's within the uh, regular I think it's if we have to send a notice to the uh, airport ops and to the airlines if it's going to be down for a certain amount of time if it's going to be down for like over 48 hours then we have to send out a major NOTAM and the airport could get derated but that's why we try to keep the, the the four crash trucks because even if let's say one goes out there's still three crash trucks there and we just steal another operator and we still have our we're still with an index um, we and most of the time when these trucks go out for something like that they're gone for an hour or two which is similar to training you know like say if the truck had to go for training or something like that but um, it's not I mean when they call for it it has to be a warranted not like hey we We've got a brush fire. We really wanted to see one of your big trucks come drive through a field. <laughs> no, it's got to be. A, um, and usually, by the time they're calling for it, yeah. it's on the news, and we're we're all watching, going, "Yeah, uh, who took the last one? Okay, you get this one." Um, so, but to start out with the airport firefighter, first thing you're going to do, and and it's it's similar, and a lot of people are surprised. We go to a fire academy. So this, this is actually Anne Arundel's Fire Academy where we have six new recruits in, in their class right now. Um, so what they do is they go to the, the regular Fire Academy and they're trained just like Anne Arundel County, Baltimore County. Myself, I was one of the recruits that was actually trained in-house at BWI. Um, I started in uh, April and we graduated uh, the shift before Christmas. So it was eight months of academy. Um, but they'll start out at a regular Fire Academy um, and like some of these guys, uh, they'll, they'll intermingle our recruits with Anne Arundel recruits and sometimes Annapolis City's recruits are in there. So they're all trained on the same basic firefighter one, firefighter two, ladders and hoses. After that, when they graduate that, then they come to the airport and then we train them in, in what's called ARF, which is Aircraft Rescue Firefighting. It's a separate uh, course. It's um, specifically all about ARF and that's when they get their silvers that's when we start teaching about the flammable liquids the uh, foams and all the special hand lines and equipment we have at the airport how competitive is it to, to, to get in there get in. With, with the class that I came in they advertised initially for 10 positions there were 1100 applicants so and 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 halfway through they brought in a class of uh, paramedic firefighters so that was a total of 15 um, 10 graduated so we lost five and out of those 10 we've lost four more um, two uh, one went down south to be a firefighter another one decided he would rather be a police officer and two other ones were um, we lost from injury in on line of duty injuries so um, it, it's a high it's a it's a rough job I've been hurt. I've been off for a couple months, um, so you know you, you're you're playing with dangerous things. Um, this is actually our fire training pit up at BWI. Um, we, our training pit's located right off Matheson Road. If you're going towards the airport on 170, if you turn right up Matheson Road, there's a fire training uh, academy right there, and the pit's probably three times the size of this building. And we this is a structure where we can practice. Um, it has pipes in it and it actually blows jet fuel out that's ignited to practice a force fed fire which would be similar to like an engine line breaking and it pumping jet fuel as it's burning. Um, so you get trained in ARF, you're not done. A lot of times at the airport we all have specialty skills because of the 
Airplanes are our bread and butter, but we also have to protect the airport. So in doing that, a rewind, we'll, we'll stay with the RF. I just looked at my slide, you know, I apologize. I'm not quite as good as Donald Trump yet, or Hillary, <laughs> but I'm working on it. So. It took him time to learn these <laughs> Yes. So if you look, this is how we normally see the airport firefighters covered in foam. Um, there's a couple reasons. Foam is our primary extinguishing agent. It's a combination of water and a foam concentrate. It's a percentage. Um, it's basically a 3% foam concentrate. So to make 100 gallons of this finished white stuff, we need 97 gallons of water and 3 gallons of the foam concentrate. So it's a 3%. There are different styles. There's different types. What's Where we have some problems is we use that gasoline tanker. Gasoline is similar to jet fuel and avgas being it's a hydrocarbon. Okay. You have a glass of water. We've all seen water, gasoline, hydrocarbons float on the surface. The foam we have is specifically designed to fight those type fires. When you get the gasoline tanker that's 85% ethanol. Ethanol is an alcohol-based system. If we put our foam on an alcohol fire, it just upsets it. Um, there's a spe special kind of foam, it's alcohol resistant foam, and there's additives that we can get, but the FAA does not allow them, they don't recognize them for commercial air, air travel. So we are just held to straight AFFF foam. And we have had a call out to, I think it was Baltimore City, for an acetone truck. And we showed up and we're like, it doesn't really, it doesn't really we can't really do anything about it, but we'll try, yeah, but you need to keep calling all the resources. Um, now for you guys, you all, I'm a uh, GA aircraft, so runs on av, av gas with a, with a really low flash point, similar to gasoline. So we've had some individuals ask us why we would put foam when there's no fire. Okay, this is how, how, how the, the AFFF foam works. The fuel, the fire burns on top of the fuel. As the foam blanket is applied, you have the white bubbles but if you notice, right in front of it is a film. The AFFF stands for aqueous film forming foam. This is what actually extinguishes the fire. The bubbles help cool and, and, and can keep it there, but it's that film that spreads across the surface of the, the liquid and basically separate, you know, uh, um, snuffs out the fire. Um, so we'll use a, a avgas leak in the summer with a high, high temperature, we will foam a fuel spill just to suppress the vapors. Because this will also suppress, you know, on a non-fire incident, it will suppress vapors too. So we've done that for fuel spills. And depending, when you look at flash points, um, flash point of avgas, like negative 40, just like gasoline. So even a winter day, that's given off vapors and it can touch off. Jet fuel, whose flash point is at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, a lot of people say, well, it's, it's only 80 degrees or it's 90 degrees. We've all walked out on a summer day and felt the asphalt. It's a lot warmer on the asphalt, on the tarmac and things like that. So we will suppress vapors given certain circumstances in that case as well. Um, considering what the danger is, foam's cheap. Okay, foam's very cheap, but that's, that's how foam works. And you'll see a lot of times they'll put foam down and you, you watch the, the, the um, on TV some of the incidents with aircraft and, they ha and you see them keep spraying the foam. Depending on the temperature, the weather requirements, the foam blanket actually, just like uh, bubbles in your bathtub, they start to go down. As that happens, the film starts weakening, so we have to do what's called reapplying the foam. You just, every 10, 15 minutes, depending on weather conditions and fire situations, we have to keep reapplying the foam. Um, until the situation's under control. Any questions about the foam? Are there times when you use water and not foam? Most of the time with an aircraft, we're going to use foam right off the bat. Now, the trucks can go. We can just pump straight water. But with an aircraft, we will use foam 99% of the time um, because of the risk of fuel. And uh, now when we train, if you note, went back to that picture of training, when we train our pit, we train with just water. So it's a lot more challenging. 
we actually, there's techniques we use to push the fire with, with the hose lines. We'll come in with two and actually separate the fire and push it back as to, to mimic creating a fire lane. Foam, it's much easier because as it goes down, it coats and runs with it. With just water, it's similar to like blowing steam off your coffee cup. If you don't keep blowing it, it just comes right back and starts steaming up. Um, and there's different techniques we use for that. Another, yes? Uh, I was going to say, um, like coming from Arizona, um, they used to close the airport all the time uh, when it got to a certain temperature. And I thought it was because they were worried about the tires popping on the, or something happening to the tires. Uh, it, it, it could be. Each air, air, airport is different. There might be something down there with that. But it can also be because of the Any fuel, if there's a fuel spill, uh, the vapor is given off until it's cleaned up. It could also be performance. A lot of times your performance data for a jet, when it goes to a certain, certain temperature, temperature and then it gets above that, then you're kind of getting into test pilot mode. And yeah, that's not something you want to do. No, no, we don't, we don't like that test pilot mode. Um, <laughs> But so that's, and, and, and it's water's your cheapest extinguishing agent that uh, most departments use just water. Foam is next. The next chemical we have is what's called Purple K or potassium bicarbonate. Uh, if you've ever seen you've, anybody, uh, hopefully, has never had the chance to use a ABC fire extinguisher, it's, it's, a, it's a powder comes out, this is, this is not BWI, but our trucks are all capable, the big trucks, of dispersing that agent. Um, some of our trucks have a special tool that I'll, I'll show you in the next one. But what this, this chemical does is depending on the, the, the situation of fire, foam by itself will work very good on a two-dimensional fire. You have a spill under an aircraft, it catches fire. It's a static two-dimensional fire situation. When you start getting into a three-dimensional fire, like that first video I showed you with the pipes that are pushing the fuel out and, and is igniting, now you have what we call a three-dimensional fire. Length, width, and now you have height. The Purple K comes in and what that, we use it in conjunction with foam and all that chemical does, it breaks that chemical reaction of the fire for a split second. It'll, it'll break that chemical reaction, but herein lies why we have to use it with the foam. If you just use this chemical, you will put the fire out. The fuel will continue to flow and the heat will still be there. This will not cool anything. So that's why we use it with the foam. After this goes in, breaks that chemical reaction, snuffs the flame, the foam and the water work as cooling and they suppress the vapors. Um, so they have to, we use them in conjunction with each other. Um, I've had a couple situations where we, we weren't able to use that on some uh, industrial applications, you have to do some thinking because you, you're, you're really limited. But in our situations at the airport, our vehicles are set up to flow the Purple K and the water. They'll, they'll flow it both from the truck turrets like this. We also have hand line turrets or hand line nozzles that look like this. Mo most of us have seen regular fire department nozzles. They look like that with the hose line that comes in and squirts the water. Our crash trucks are equipped with these, these Williams nozzles. They're called a hydrochem nozzle. What they do is this is the foam and water line that comes through and sprays like a regular fire hose. This line here is the Purple K. It comes in from a pressurized tank and is injected right into the middle of the, the water stream through that nozzle. What that does is you don't get that powder effect. It's not affected by wind. So you turn your foam purple but it carries it a lot farther, you have a lot more control. Um, and from somebody who's used these, it takes, it takes some getting used to, the, to use a nozzle with two shutoffs. Um, we do a lot of training with these, but our crash trucks are equipped with all these lines. And it, it works very well because the, old, the older system with just the, just the purple K and just the powder, it was very wind dependent. You didn't get as far of a reach, you had to really be uncomfortably close to something to use that, those lines. These lines, you have much, much greater reach, much greater safety, and much more control. Um, and when I go into some of the other things at the airport, beyond ARF, this is why we called it the airport uh, firefighter, there's other training we have. Um, for example, 
uh, about 75% of the department at BWI are HAZMAC technicians because you get things on aircraft and nowadays with uh, all the terrorist threats, the WMDs and things like that, um, about 75% of us are HAZMAT technicians. Um, another most, most of us are all rescue technicians to use the uh, Jaws of Life vehicle rescue, also machinery because we have a lot of moving parts, the, the baggage belts, so on and so forth, spread out throughout the airport. And then we're also confined space certified. So depending on where it happens, some of the baggage tunnels underneath the airport can get uh, rather claustrophobic uh, if you're up in there. And even, even some of the areas on board an aircraft, if you have somebody go down from a vapor in the luggage compartment of an aircraft, that can be a, a, a confined space depending on how far into the aircraft they are. Um, so it's a lot of training that goes on, and every day it's hours of training. Um, so that's pretty much just a firefighter. The next step would be like myself, a driver. You have to get trained on, um, th there's more classes. Uh, there's, as I said, there's a special, the, the ARF firefighter, aircraft rescue firefighting class. To be a driver, there's the ARF driver operator that shows you how to operate the, the crash trucks and how to approach different scenarios and things like that. We have it at BWI, which we're very lucky to have, and it helps our drivers immensely, is this, what we call the simulator. So what it is, is basically the cab stripped down of one of our crash trucks with the computer model of BWI Airport. So we can go over there, and there's an operator that runs the computer system, and it, it is extremely accurate as far as taxiway layouts, runway layouts, they can change day, night, weather scenarios, they can blow tires on the truck so you get used to it. And you, it, it actually helps when you figure the cost. One of our new trucks just came in with about right around 1.2 million. So you think of the advantages of being able to take somebody and for a couple weeks put them in one of these before you let them go in, in one of the, and, and if you guys from pilot standpoints there's not much room for error on an, air, on an airport. When you start factoring aircraft, you know, ground control and things like that, there's, uh, um, there's a lot of moving things out there. And it's, it's much better for us to evaluate new drivers on the simulators before we turn them over. And this is a, a look of the interior of the simulator. It's not much. It's pretty very similar to one of the other the older crash truck, your two joysticks for your nozzles, a steering wheel and your gauges. And the, the screens are all, wrap all the way around you. You even have your mirror so you can see what's behind you. Um, we were talking a little earlier about uh, motion sickness. <laughs> These have gotten more guys and ladies sick than any, anything I know. Um, it, it's been good. We've had even um, one time they brought down the uh, uh, ground controllers and we, we put them in the simulator so they could experience what we experienced down on the ground. And, and, and they thought it was a really good learning experience because their airfield is from five stories up. It's another thing when you're on the ground on the, on the trucks going up and down hills and things like that. So it, it's been a very good learning tool and, and, and a very useful tool. So we'll, we'll get into the equipment that we get to drive. These are our two older crash trucks. These are E1 Titans. Uh, these crash trucks carry 3,000 gallons of water, 425 gallons of foam, and 450 pounds of that Purple K uh, um, dry, dry chemical, dry powder, excuse me. They have two turrets, one on the roof, one on the bumper. Um, the vehicle can go pretty much anywhere. Uh, the tires on these vehicles are about my shoulder height. So it'll give you an idea of uh, height and, and width-wise. They're 11 foot wide. Those are about 46 foot long, roughly. So it, it, it's a big vehicle driven by one, one individual. And everything can be run right from, the, right from the driver's seat. It goes in pump, discharges. If you've seen the joystick, it looks just like that. And you can discharge your tank of water quicker than you'd like to. What's the service life? Um, these. I believe are 2004s. 
think they're 2004s, and they're due to be replaced 2017, 2018. So we get about 15 years, and then the FAA wants, because the, the progress that, that, it, that it makes is unbelievable. It, it, it really is. When you compare these, and I'll show you our new, the newer ones. What, what do they do when they retire? They, they, they usually pass them on to another airport. Like uh, one of the ones we retired, our old Oshkosh went to Hagerstown. Um, we had another. We have another Oshkosh that's there that uh, we've got in storage. They're not sure what they're going to do with that. Whether they're going to keep it for a training academy, like a training academy truck or something like that. But these are the newer, the newer models. These are the Oshkosh Strikers. Uh, they're called the Global Striker. They're the ones that are shipped all over the world. You can you can just see from the cab the difference of the the shape and and the big difference is this new feature here, which is the high reach extendable turret. Um, I have a video at the end. I had it working. Hopefully, it'll continue to work, which shows uh, uh, one of these vehicles actually piercing a 737. So you can see how it, how it how it pierces. This is a 50 foot boom. There's a um, Basically, for lack of a better term, there's a five-foot spike on the end of it. And the end of the spike has holes. What happens is if it's a cargo aircraft fire or cabin fire, the crash truck would come up to the side of the aircraft, pierce the side of it, and turn on the, the, the piercing nozzle water flow. It'll flow 250 gallons a minute, and basically it's like a sprinkler head inside the aircraft. Um, it takes a lot of getting used to, and there's a lot of, we have to, the amount of training we have to do on them to keep proficient is, is quite extraordinary. Um, but like that vehicle there, that's our newest. That's approximately, like I said, about $1.2 million. Um, the windshield, no one will tell me how much it costs. The windshield runs from here all the way back to here. It's a curved piece of glass about the size of this table that runs all the way over your head. No one wants to be the first one to put a ding in one. Um, but the trucks are really really amazing. Underneath the vehicles, you can see here and here, are sprinkler heads. So if to approach the aircraft and there's burning fuel, you put the sprinklers on underneath, it'll blush, push foam out underneath the, the truck so you can get within range of the aircraft. The front, there's sprinklers across the front that drip water down um, because of the heat that uh, jet fuel gives off the BTUs to keep your windshield in the front of your truck from catching fire. So it's, it's really an amazing piece of equipment. Compartments are very, very spartan. They don't carry the equipment like a regular fire truck does. There's hand lines on there, so if we do have to pull off a hand line, there's also that hydrochem line that can pull off and, and we can discharge agent. But the primary function of these trucks is to get in, get in close, and knock down as much of the fire as they can. Um, so hopefully, if you fly into BWI, you'll never have to meet one of them. Um, but an impressive piece of equipment. Here's a still picture of what one looks like piercing. So this is another training aircraft we have up there, DC-10. There's a training prop right here um, that we use for practice. So we'll practice making an approach. The boom comes up and we just practice piercing that, piercing that prop in different locations. To assist us with that, uh, this is our, the other twin to that one, 32. Um, they have uh, cameras located on the end of the boom. So if for some reason we wanted to go up and look down an aircraft, like put the, the end of the boom inside an aircraft and turn the camera, we could look down it. Um, they both also have uh, FLIR cameras on them where we can scan the side of an aircraft to see if there's any hot spots. We can scan brakes if it, the plane comes in and we have a hot brake issue. We can scan the brakes of the, the aircraft to see what the temperature is. And of course, the, the, one of the main things with the FLIR is, we've all seen the aircraft videos on TV, there's a tremendous amount of hydrocarbon smoke and it helps us see through that. So we can make sure the agent that we have is getting to where it needs to be put. Um, when you figure 3,000 gallons, it sounds like a lot of water. With these trucks flowing full, that truck will be empty in 90 seconds. So you don't have a lot of time. One of the most senior guys that taught me how to operate one of these vehicles, and it was an amazing tactic, when you're discharging and holding the trigger, hold your breath. When you have to breathe, let up, check your cameras, make sure your agent's going where it needs to be going, get back in it again. Because 
you know, at, at, at three o'clock in the morning when there's smoke, you can, you can be missing hot spots as you're flowing with, with that amount of water coming out of the front of your truck. You don't have much, much time. Um, tactic wise, a BWI with the three vehicles, the first vehicle will take up a position to separate the, the, the passengers from the fire. <coughs> Second vehicle will come in and assist him. The third vehicle um, will usually will stand back, depending on the situation. There's no hard and fast rules. That way, when one of the first two trucks run out of agent, <coughs> there's no lag in time. When one truck, the first truck, let's say he runs out of his, his water and foam, and he's got to go refill water, that third truck can move right in and keep the pressure on. Is everything flare equipped? Uh, the crash trucks are all flare equipped. Now the engines, the towers, the, the normal, like we see here on Kent Island and Easton, those, those are not flare equipped. They have the handheld thermal imaging camera for, for the crews. <coughs> but the reason the, I was asking is, that, you know, that San Francisco, they had a passenger killed yes. by a non-flare equipped. Yes. yes, that's a, that was a, um, a very horrible situation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and a lot of the FLIRs, it, it depends, I'm not a FLIR expert, depending on the temperature and what was happening, it, and I'm not saying if she was, let's say, underneath a piece of wreckage or, or, or something was blocking them, the FLIR might not pick it up. What these won't pick up is chain link fences. You, and you think, chain link fences outside in the winter, ambient air temperature, it's not picking up that difference. Now. One of the things we're trained, we have to know, I mean, we have maps and we have to be able to draw everything, but if you were driving just using your FLIR, which we sometimes have to do in the smoke and stuff, you have to be very careful because if it's ambient temperatures, it won't pick it up. Um, but amazing pieces of equipment that can do a lot. I, I told you guys before you asked about the uh, fuel tank fire or the fuel truck. That's the picture from 895. Where it, where it was coming in with that, with that uh, gasoline tanker that went off the bridge. Um, he basically, uh, this is one of the older crash trucks, same, same capacities, an older style. The, uh, this is a T3000. He made one pass. He started up here and made one pass. He had to back up to get this because it was a little out of his, his first reach. But that, that's the amount of fire that these vehicles can put out is mind boggling. What is the reach? Um, effective depending on, you can figure 100, 100 yeah, 125 if you put, but a lot of it depends on wind and, and, and things like that. But you can see he's reaching, it's that four lane highway, he's all the way over to the shoulder. And, at, and, and those trucks can drive and, and discharge agents. So he locked it over 90 degrees and just feathered it up and down and went right down the lane and, and, and knocked it out. Um, and you can see that a lot of times we'll have spotters around the truck as it's operating. Um, some of the training. Um, any questions? How do you refill the truck? Uh, the trucks are refilled. That's a good question. I'm going to back up a slide and show you that. It's easy to show you on this. If you look right here, you can see the, 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 the fill ports. It fills with a regular fire hose. Um, we, and we have what we call rapid resupply drills at the station that we do twice a year just to make sure we can, and we can refill one of these trucks. I think my best time that we've had is two minutes, nine seconds because there's pressure requirements and things like that, but we can put 3,000 gallons of water on board in just about two minutes. Um, and the foam also? The foam, the foam, nah, that's not, we have to go back to the station for that. But the way, it, we usually get about, you can get about two and a half, three tanks of, of water for one tank of foam. So you can, you can get a couple refills of water with that 3% ratio uh, to, to one tank of foam. The newer ones, because they're, they're, they want to be more streamlined and aerodynamic because we buy these for their fuel efficiency, is behind, <laughs> is behind this door right here. Okay, you basically roll that up and it looks just like the other one. There's your fill parts right there that you can fill the truck up with. With the training we have to have, we're, we have to, every year we have to get training on, uh, and there's 11 categories. 
um, real quick, that's airport familiarization. That's runways, taxiways, driving on, driving on the aircraft. Aircraft familiarization. So depending on, you know, every month we do a different type of aircraft, whether it's a CRJ, 737, one of the Airbuses. Um, rescue and firefighting personnel safety. Emergency communications. Uh, the use of the hose, use of nozzles, hoses, and appliances, which would be like that hydrochem not line and things like that. Um, application of the extinguishing agents that we have, basically the water, the foam, the, the purple K. Um, emergency aircraft evacuations. That's one of the ones you're seeing here. This would be like I talked about in the beginning of the, of the class where the air crew incapacitated can't open the doors. We practice up the ladder, opening the doors, um, and we'll go around an aircraft and do this. This was uh, just done a little bit, a little, little while ago, uh, um, on a 737. That the well, that's what you can see here. It's one of the things we train everybody. You've got the, your your slide warning device, and it, it's a bar runs across here. Southwest is has been a great partner. Um, they upgraded their simulators that they use for their uh, uh, flight crews, and they actually we have their old simulators in our fire station. So they were nice enough to bring them over, and we can practice trying to reach in there and unhooking the bar, um, and things like that. But the bigger the bigger trick is, and this is what, because you have to throw that door, it's 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 a considerable it's a considerable uh, a heft to that door. And then um, some of the last thing is firefighting operations. Uh, adapting and using structural equipment for aircraft rescue, uh, aircraft cargo hazards, and then firefighter duties in the airport plan. Um, so continually, all year round. Um, and, and last is we have, to, we have to have one live fire drill every year where that one video I show with the guys going in with the fire, we have to do, everybody in the department has to do at least one of those a year with actual JP, uh, the jet fuel. Um, also, once every three years, the airport has to run a large-scale emergency drill. This is one of those drills we call the EPLEX, where we bring in BWI, Anne Arundel County, Howard County, pretty much any emergency service in the state of Maryland comes up. We practice mass casualty. We practice, you know, inter interdepartment communications. Um, it's actually a very good training exercise. We do one at one of them every three years. So you can see this is just one of the, uh, the mass casualty triage staging areas. We have volunteers come in, they get moulaged up, they put the makeup on them to look the, make the wounds look real so we can practice prioritizing the, the patients. Um, and we actually have at the airport a, uh, for lack of a better word, it's a, it's a large three axle like landscape trailer that is loaded with nothing but medical equipment for 200 victims backboards, oxygens, everything is just loaded, ready to go uh, in case of a uh, worst case scenario. But we do one of them every three years. We do all that training so that when things like this happen, we have a plan. Um, so you can see it can happen anytime. That was a, uh, uh, an engine fire. But it's not all uh, emergencies. This is one of the better things we get to do at the airport. Um, this is the, the uh, honor flights that we do for the veterans. So that is uh, pretty much, uh, we try to get every honor flight that comes in, we give them the arch. Um, and every now and then for other special scenarios like um, when the Ravens came back in from winning the Super Bowl, <laughs> we gave them a water arch. Um, and of course, pilot retiring and things like that, we, we, we do the water arches for them. At, at BWI. I've done a couple for pilots retiring. Um, so it is, it is pretty good. One of the last things I, I will tell you, and I wanted to go over this, being that you guys are pilots, at BWI we have um, an alert system. Um, basically it's, it, it's, if you're in the air and you have an emergency, the tower will classify it as the hopefully just one of two alerts and, and not the third one, and you'll understand why when I tell you what the alerts are. The first one we have at BWI is an alert one, which is also known as a local standby. Um, that's when an aircraft has or is suspected to have an operational defect 
The de defect should not normally cause serious difficulty for the aircraft to achieve a safe landing. I, I wrote that down to make sure I had it um, the way the uh, advisory circular said. Um, at BWI, the tower has a, has a phone. As soon as that phone comes up, an alert tone goes off on our station. It's hardwired. Um, they'll pick it up and they will give the following information. The aircraft type, number of passengers and crew on board, the amount of fuel remaining on board, and the nature of emergency. So those, th and then any other pertinent information, landing on 1028, the, the landing runway, how many minutes out they are. Um, and they will, they'll call us and tell us we have an alert one. At alert one, the local standby, everybody goes out, gears up, trucks are started. Usually the crash trucks pull out of the fire station, sit on the apron, and we wait for further instruction. Now, depending on the nature of the emergency, the division chief on board can upgrade that to the next level of alert. Um, the next level would be an alert two, which is a full emergency. That's when an aircraft has or is suspected of having an operational defect that affects normal flight operations to the extent that there is a danger of an accident. At that position on BWI, we go to our standby positions. Um, I'll use this board right here. This is the runway here. So the standby positions, one goes to the approach end. One, one crash truck stays midfield. The other crash truck makes it, goes to the departure end of the runway. So we've got everything covered. If they come in short, we've got a vehicle there. They come long, we have a vehicle there. If they're in the middle, we have vehicles coming from each direction. Um, so that's the alert too. Now you'll understand why I said hopefully you never get to the third one, which is an alert three, which is actual an aircraft accident. Um, that denotes that an aircraft accident has occurred. Um, it can be on airport property, off airport property, um, and it, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, it could be aircraft into a tug. Uh, um, we've had some um, ones where aircraft have, have gone off the runway. The, Alert 3 that they had over the summer that we got that 737 from was an, an incident where uh, a backing incident happened with a tug and the front landing gear collapsed. Um, so it, it, does, it does happen, but those are the three systems. So depending on what the nature of emergency you give to the air traffic controller, they're going to determine whether it's a, a, a 1, 2, or a 3 for, for, uh, for us. Um, any questions? Yes, sir. Does the uh, incident commander, does he have his own vehicle? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, 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 the division chief on duty, we have a division chief on duty at the airport. He has his own, uh, it's, a, it's a suburban now. Um, and then the, the, the line officers, the, the, the chief of the department and his three deputies also have vehicles. But the division chief uh, of the, in charge of the shift has his own vehicle. The captain rides on the ladder tower. The lieutenant rides on the engine and the crash trucks are all by themselves. Um, and there's really, some people have asked, you know, well, does this truck always go to the nose? Is this one always? And it's very difficult because I'm sure like, like most flights, no two are the same. Um, any incident, it's not gonna be the same. And the first truck, if, if the aircraft was, let's say, shedding parts and he went down and took out three of his tires, well, now he's out of the, he's out of the situation. So the other trucks have to jockey for position. So we, we, just, we just communicate with each other and, and, and we work off of how the trucks arrive and what the situation is. Is there a radio? Is, is every individual man with a radio then? So yes. All, all, all firefighters at BWI have our own portable radio. All the vehicles have, have a mobile radio that talks to the portable radios in our dispatch center. And they also are equipped with a ground radio. So any of the vehicles on, at a BWI can talk to the ground, their ground controllers and the aircraft. And we have the special, like they'll tell us to switch over to emergency frequencies so we're not backing up gr uh, the ground channels and things like that. So, but we can talk to the pilots, to each other. So we have a lot of communications. Actually, the headsets for the driver operators, <laughs> it takes a little getting used to. This ear is fire dispatch. This ear is ground control. <laughs> So you have to, and we have a switch that we just switch forward and back to whether we're talking to fire personnel or aircraft. So it takes a little getting used to and to be hearing most of us, 
the fire radio gets turned down while we're out on the, so we can concentrate on just what the pilot's saying, what his issues are, and things like that. Um, we'll see if this works. It was working before. So this is, you can see how they're opening. This would be, for some reason we pull up, the doors aren't open. This is one of our new guys. So this is probably one of his first times ever doing this. No, no, we, we knew in that case we'd open that a couple of times, but they, they all know to check that. How to do it. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, this is one of those turrets go, piercing the aircraft, one of those high-reach extendable turrets. I was hesitant to show this to a bunch of pilots, figuring they wouldn't really want us to see what we'd be doing to the aircraft, but... Uh, it just shows a really, you could see from the video how far the standoff is and how, how much reach the vehicles have. For a, for a cargo fire, it's, it's really quite, quite a thing. Well, what, what the, with that, that space between the window, um, that comes out to right, right, right about over your head because we, we were in there when we were doing that because that's the window where they say there's not that much and you don't want to get into the overhead bins. Um, and we were curious to see just where that would come out inside the airplane. And it came out right because I sat in one of the seats and just was like, oh, okay, that's where it's going to come in. Okay. And then there's the example of it going into the cargo area where it can pierce into the cargo area. Um, Unfortunately, yeah, they, this one, no, doesn't have it. It comes into about here. It sticks about that far into the cargo area. So if you did have a, a luggage, you know, fire or something down the cargo bay, you could go right in and, and deal with that. Um, at least take a lot of the, the fight out of the situation before you start sending people in, on, onto the aircraft. Um, that's just some of the training that was a, an aircraft we had. We just did that training a couple days ago. Um, is the Hamacho rescue tools is right outside the airport. They're very good about letting us uh, work with their tools and, and work with new tools. You can see there's, because we have to practice, we have a lot of vehicle accidents, 195, you know, 295. Uh, even you'd be surprised at the accident we have right around the terminal. Um, so we go over to the Hamacho and they let us use uh, this tool right here is actually has has special tips on it for cutting open aircraft skin. Is this the manufacturer? Yes, the manufacturer of Hamacho Rescue Tools is right outside the airport property, um, and great great individuals, great individuals. So we actually got some cars and they let us come over there and use our tools, use some of their new tools. It, it, it's it's pretty impressive. Um, and if any of you ever want to see, this is the BWI Fire Rescue's Twitter page. So as we do training throughout the year, uh, it goes on there. Uh, if you guys want to see just what's going on with um, BWI Fire Rescue, our chief goes out and puts stuff on there. And um, that's about it. Any questions? Yes, sir. Have you seen any good video of the uh, 767 of the higher reported? All I've seen has been kind of all the way away on the wrong side. Oh, is that, is that the one? Yes, that's the one where they had the uncontrolled engine. Yeah, that, the, the same video that you've seen, we've seen so far, where you're on the unburned side, right. we haven't gotten able to see that, that burn side. Any um, put out yeah, no, I haven't seen anything from the other side. It's just like the one in uh, Las Vegas. Yeah. You had a lot of video of the 
the one side by the camera, but you couldn't get to the other side where was most of the, the fire taking place. Um, w believe me, we'll get in the video. We try to watch that, and we just try to learn from w what goes on, and you know. Um, yes, yes, and, and if you looked at the one side of that, I think they have it in here. You can see the extent of the the, the fuselage burning behind it, where it. That's it, the Lauderdale FedEx there. Well. That, that burned up about the same day as the other one. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the, the FedEx one, she, when oh, she went down. that was went a DC-10. That, that was a DC-10. It, it, yeah. it spiral off into the, off the but that you could see just how much, um, and if oh, yeah. you get a good up-close video of that, you can actually see where the skin of the aircraft started to melt. Yeah. Um, wing, wing yeah. Oh, yeah, you can see yeah, just the how the, the, the wing hit the ground and everything like that. So you can see how quickly these... They hold up well, but given the heat and the BTU, I mean, for example, had, uh, uh, yep, well, uh, uh, jet fuel for, a, it gives off 1,900 BTUs per pound. It equates to about 128,000 BTUs per gallon. So times that by a fully loaded, there's a lot of, a lot of BTUs being given off. Which is, lot, which is why you see the, the airport firefighters with the silver gear. Um, and that's pretty much, it's, it's the same as regular firefighter gear that you, we wear for structural fires, but with an aluminized coating. And that's pretty much to just to reflect the radiant heat. Um, it works very well. We the, lucky we weren't going that far. <laughs> when they had that much fuel. So, but yeah, no, this, uh, our, the, the chiefs and the BWI do a pretty good job of updating that. Um, this this Twitter so okay. I'm not on Twitter they just told me about it so I you, you just go type it in and it you can still get the feeds um, it depends it like uh, in that situation the videos that I saw where you saw the one truck come in here and then you saw the other truck come in and he kind of stopped to wait for people and then he came around this side it's it's I wasn't in these trucks, so I can't say. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the first truck, his thing, he, because we couldn't see it, I'm pretty sure he, he saw a lot of impingement on the fuselage. Priority one is to protect that fuselage, protect the people. So that's probably why he came in in that direction and coated that fuselage with foam to try to make sure it didn't get inside the aircraft, which then you have a whole different animal. And this, the, the, the other one that came around the front, he was probably coming to, like I said, support that guy and work work together on him. And the, the other thing is by keeping it on this way, they're not pushing it to the, where the slides are and everybody's coming down. They're trying to keep that situation boxed up in one area. And uh, so that that's what I can assume, but I could talk about it all day. Those guys did a great job, a great job uh, for what they had. Um, any other questions, suggestions? That's great. Thank you. Oh, no problem. And, and like I said, folks, the video on my Twitter page is here, and it gives you all the all the all the things. I mean, it's pretty neat. If you guys are ever flying, you want to learn CPR, we have our kiosk there. It's a CPR kiosk. It gives you the timing for the new yeah. contact information. If we wanted to, I can get you contact. Yep, yeah, I can get you contact information. Not a problem. Um, but yeah, that, that's a. Excellent one. Well, if nobody has any questions, uh, thank you very much, um, and hopefully, and hopefully, we'll never meet.